Throughout Illinois, work is underway to uncover and reconstruct the human past. From the site of a 19th century settlement in Winnebago County, to a prehistoric farm in Madison, to the yard of a historic house in Gallatin, and to East St. Louis, where huge prehistoric villages existed centuries ago, this is the story of Illinois archaeology in the field. We are at the historic town of Pecatonic. It was a town founded by Stephen Mack in 1836. He chose this spot because it's at the confluence of two rivers, the Pecatonica and the Rock Rivers. We are looking for evidence of buildings that once stood here. The mostly volunteer crew is studying the original structures by uncovering the remains of their rock foundations. The information will benefit the Mactown Living History and Education Center in its efforts to preserve local history and culture. The organization, a volunteer organization, that wants to restore this area to the way it looked in the 1840s to use as a teaching facility. We don't really know about their day-to-day -day activities. Those were never written down. We don't know for sure what animals they kept, um, what kinds of foods they ate. Did they just have domesticated animals? This would be, Rochelle thought it was some sort of pickling jar. It's fun to work out here and find stuff, and yeah, it was really exciting when we finally found the, the foundation. And the Mactown excavation is looking for evidence of what's known as the historic occupation of the site, the recent past from a period of Illinois history that includes written documents, even public records. But down the hill and along the bank is evidence of human occupation. This is where prehistoric villagers harvested food from the river clam beds. When we did our original systematic survey of 30 acres out here, we put in over a thousand shovel probes. Over 800 of those shovel probes were positive containing either historic or prehistoric artifacts and sometimes both. You're witnessing the single most important aspect about the study of the human past, time and its constant unyielding and unforgiving forward movement. Whatever we want to know about the human past, we must learn from what others have left behind. What we often get out of the archaeological record is very much a, sort of an aggregate picture of a lot of things left behind by a lot of people over time. And, uh, and so those gives us sort of a profile of a community or a society. The archaeological record is much more about kind of aggregate information. Archaeology studies the human past through the material remains or material culture. We had a sample size of about eight. And this is a different kind of a tool. This is a big block of sandstone which has these numerous battered depressions in it and they're uh, doing certain things on these that produces these worn out uh, depressions. It's a but social science sub-discipline and within archaeology there exists many more divisions of study. Archaeologists excavating this site in Madison County are studying prehistoric farming, not only through the artifacts found, but also from core samples that indicate multiple flood episodes. So a lot of the research questions we have, uh, aside from just who is here and what they were doing here, deal with farming and the environment. A lot of what I do is uh, environmental dynamics, looking at human environment interactions through time and how those have changed. The information gathered through archaeology may help not only to understand the past, but also help reconstruct it. Hickory Hill overlooks the Saline River Valley in Gallatin County in southeastern Illinois. Built in the late 1830s, the house belonged to John Hart Crenshaw, a landowner who operated nearby Salt Springs, in addition to lumber and grist mills. Hickory Hill represents a chapter in Illinois history when indentured servitude was legal. The excavations of the yard may result in the reconstruction of the outbuildings to help interpret that period of time. Really there are no artifacts uh, associated with the Crenshaw family. So we're hoping to recover things here 
both associated with the Crenshaws themselves and their African-American servants that will help interpret the site. So if someday we're talking about an interpretive display or an interpretive building out here, you could have, you could have artifacts that would directly relate both to the Crenshaws and their African-American servants. In East St. Louis, the focus is on saving the past from a new interstate bridge construction project. The bridge will span the Mississippi River, and massive support columns will be built on land where significant prehistoric features have been found. One of those sites is found beneath the abandoned national stockyard that existed since the 1870s. On the first couple days when we were uh, just starting to get this area open up, and uh, we saw house after house after house, uh, scattered over such a large area, uh, we really realized that this was really something uh, very significant. The East St. Louis excavation is rewriting what we know about the prehistory of the area. Until now, archaeologists believed the largest population centers were located only in nearby Cahokia. These findings suggest otherwise, that the population may have been spread over a larger area. The trenches were on top of everything else, and then this one would have been the second structure, and then this one here would have been the first structure in this spot. So it shows that they, you know, reused the space multiple times to build multiple structures. And then we also have structures that look like this, which as you can tell is much smaller than something like this. So there's a great range and variety in what we're finding out there, and something like this would probably... The study of the human past through archaeology is unique because it cannot be replicated in a lab. Whatever we learn from the human past must be studied from what is removed from the ground. Once removed, the original context is lost unless careful techniques are used to preserve the relationship of what's found so that it may be studied and interpreted even decades later. The first impression of an archaeological site is the amount of manual labor involved. Difficult work performed under tough conditions, like the heat of a summer day. But before a single shovelful of topsoil is removed, the site undergoes a transformation from an empty field to a carefully drawn map superimposed with units of measurement represented by a grid. The grid measures every activity on the site. That's because the grid manages the full context of the entire site. An example is the ground-penetrating radar performed on the Hickory Hill site in Gallatin County. Um, you can see that that's a nice right, right angle. There's sort of a right angle there. As the radar scans the soil, it creates images or profiles of magnetic resistance. Yeah, yeah, on that side. Side. It might be worth a test unit here. Mm -hmm. Here's the well emerging. Those results were then placed within the grid. Several months later, archaeologist Mark Wagner decides where to excavate based on the ground radar images and their position on the grid. The unit that is going to intersect Anomaly 34, which is what we're coming to, into now, what we're doing is testing these anomalies to see if they are uh, in, indeed some sort of feature and how deep they are and what they have in them. Once the specific outline of the units is identified, the excavation begins. The unit is dug in levels of 5 or 10 centimeters or more, depending on the known depth. The levels excavated for this stone privy in Gallatin County, for example, were made in levels of 25 centimeters. As the layers are removed, features like these dark stains begin to appear. They're photographed and drawn to scale. The process is then repeated until the feature is gone and the layer reaches undisturbed soil. Each level is removed and screened. As each level is screened, various artifacts are collected, like fragments of glass, iron, or ceramics. All this material that's coming out of the top of that feature pretty much looks mid to late 19th century. This is Rockingham glaze. Yellowware, which is The artifacts popular. are then placed in bags that are labeled according to the unit and layer found and sent to the lab. In the lab, bags are emptied and the contents washed. The typical archaeological site may yield tens of thousands of artifacts with every one cataloged according to the layer and location within the site grid. It's through this process where patterns emerge. If you examine the artifacts from an entire site, then compare them to other sites, the resulting information can yield a general idea about that particular moment in time. 
A great deal of, of the explanations that we get in archaeology really are kind of probability statements because mm -hmm. as a social science we don't have a laboratory, we can't go back and replicate what people were doing. 58 and 59. This is why archaeologists go to considerable lengths to preserve the context of what they find. Have you been putting them in a meter now? The four units that we just laid out, the reason they're dashed is that they're, just, they're potential units at this point. They haven't been excavated. If Once they get excavated, I'll turn them into a solid. Since we have no photographs or no maps of the yard, and we have no mention that there's a summer kitchen here in any record, uh, we're just trying to find out if one was here. You would expect them to have a summer kitchen. Once the feature is gone, it's gone. But careful records can last forever. Archaeologists in the future could study those records and reconstruct the excavation unit layer by layer. The site and what was recovered from it could help provide answers to questions that haven't yet been asked.